So, I want to start by saying that this session is powered by Janet from School Limited and Counselor University. And uh, one of the things I also advise is at the end of this year, um, we also run some online programs, most of which are free. You can actually sign up, visit our website, www.counselluniversity.com, to sign up for some of the programs. And I believe they will, they will help you. Now, one are, one are, what are the things that I expect you to learn at the end of this session? What are the things that I expect you to go home with by the time I'm, I'm, I'm through with this session for today? Number one, I want you, for those of us, by show of hands, how many of us are in, in business? As we work for pharmacies or we own our own businesses, how many of us by show of hands? How many of us work um, in um, medical re related businesses? Show of hands. Okay, others, others, where do you work? Sorry? Okay, you work in a pharmacy. Good. What of you? Okay, he works in a hospital. What of you? In a hospital. Okay, how many of us work in hospitals? Okay. Now, the great thing about working in the hospital is that part of the things we are going to teach you is because, you know, with the way things are running in Nigeria, very soon, almost all hospital pharmacies are about to be turned into independent units. I don't know if they've done it in Ogun State. So some of the things you'll be learning today will position you to know how to structure the hospital, um, you know, the hospital where you work. So I, the things that are, you know, positioned in such as it can become a profitable entity on its own. So one of the things we'll be learning is for you to be able to differentiate in your system, in your organization, if you are involved in business or if people are actually involved in business. We'll help people to understand the difference between business and business. Because a lot of time, people are in what we term business. There are activities we are running around. But if you check the level of productivity, it's extremely low. So I want to, because I always share this example that there are two pharmacies I know which are um, 200 meters apart. On a daily basis, one is doing about 250 to 200,000 a day. Why the other one is doing below three hundred thousand, below, below thirty thousand a day. Now, how can two pharmacies sitting side by side be attending to the same kind of of patients, and one is doing about one thousand percent of what the other one is doing? Part of the things we'll be showing, sharing with you today, are the things that you learn that can show you what you need to do so that your productivity can jump up. The second thing that we'll be sharing with, um, the second thing you'll be learning today will success driving standard operating procedure. What are standard operating procedure? What standard operating procedure means? What are the step by step things that if you'll be doing every day will guarantee you that your business or what activity will be very successful? The third thing we'll be looking at will be radical business improvement techniques. What are the things that we can bring into our business? So that when we bring these things into our business, they can move our business forward. The next thing that we'll be learning is setting goals for the next 20, 12 months. The year has just started and we are moving forward into the year. It has been discovered that a study was done in Harvard. And during, in the study, they tried to find out in a set of about 100 students, after, two, after 20 years, what happened? How many of these people became successful? And at the end of the day, they found out that about 5% of those 200 students that set goals for their business, for their life, actually became about 100% more successful than others. So one of the things we'll be teaching you today will be how to set goals for the next 12 months. And finally, will be that will drive success. Now, for those of us who own our businesses, has there been any day in our business that sales was just very good for us? How many of us? Sales on that particular day, in the past 30 days, sales was very good. Any of us here? Can I see by showing of hands? Okay. So we have days that sales was just very good. For the other people here, have we had days that sales was just too bad? We've had days, but right? That's right. Now, 
Now, what I want to ask us is, can we really recall the things that we did on those days that sales were very good? How many of us remember? Now, how many of us recall the things that we did on those days that sales were very bad, that we say, oh, on these days, these are the things we do, did and we don't want to do them again? How many of us recall? Now, because we don't have consistency in our inputs, we say on the days that sales were very good, these are the things that we did. And every day we say, okay, now, since the days that sales were good, everybody was smiling on that particular day. We say we'll be consistent in our smiles. On the days that sales were very good, we noticed that everybody was wearing neat dressings. And we say, okay, because these things were part of the things that made sales very good on this particular day, everybody henceforth will be dressing in this particular way. Now, also maybe on the days that sales were bad, maybe did we notice that maybe our systems were not operating very well. It means that on those days that systems were not operating very well, that sales were low, it means we need to be consistent in our systems so that sales can actually be very high. The point I'm trying to make is that if you don't standardize the different processes that is driving success in your business, it will become very difficult for your business to grow. But if you, especially on those days, that sales is very good for us, you need to look at the things you did on those days and you capture them. So that at any particular point, you can say, these are the things that we must do to ensure that our sales continue to grow. Because one of the key challenges that I have it, this also applies to those of us who are in hospital pharmacy. Because if you look at those of us who are in hospital, there are days that you say sales was very good today. You might need to find out, was there any particular doctor that was on call that particular day? So you say, this is the way this particular doctor prescribed on, that, on those days. And any day this doctor is on call, we are, our sales is good. So what you now need to do is try to get other doctors to prescribe like this same doctor. So that when you now have consistency in your prescription pattern, you are sure that because there is consistency, that sales on those on almost every other day will continue to be high. Are we following? So what we'll be go going through now will be step by step on how to standardize the various things that drive success in every organization. Now, some of the things I'll be sharing might sound um, painful to us in the ear. Because one of the most difficult things to do is acquire new habits. But if you are not open to acquiring new habits, just like we saw in the process of drawing, joining those dots together, it will become extremely difficult for you to actually move your business forward. So I want you to really be open to new ideas. And one thing I always share during my, my presentation is, even if you don't accept what I say, don't reject it. Now, assuming somebody comes here, walks in here, and tells you that I can turn this table into gold, how many of us will believe it? Uh, Madam said it's impossible. How many of us think that you can actually turn this table into diamond? How many of us think it's possible? Now, every of us think it's possible. Now, what, but what should be the thing that will actually say, if somebody says, come here and say, I can turn this thing into diamond? The, the conventional thing is, is not possible. But for the unconventional thing, is show me how to do it. Because for you, you might say it's not possible. But I can tell you that if you go back about 100 years ago, and you tell people living in that day that you can actually fly, they'll tell you it's not possible. But because we are living in an era where we see people fly, we know it's common. But I can actually tell you, let's say you take something like this now. Where does diamond come from? It comes from applying high temperature and pressure to any material. Because the, the carbons are in the earth applied with high pressure and temperature, it converts the carbon in the soil into very hard rock. Meaning that if we take this table now, based on science, and apply high pressure and high temperature to it, it will get to a state that will solidify and actually give us diamond. My point is, because this is your way of thinking doesn't mean it's the right way or the best way. It can actually be done better. Some of us actually use, um, when we're starting with phones, 
use Nokia 3310. How many of us remember? But I'm sure that if they dash you the Nokia 3310 now and even pay you to use it, you'll be ashamed to bring it out. But when it came out, it used to be the phone for the big boys. The same thing applies to the principles of business. So, let's start with the first step. Now, I want to, because whatever we'll be writing, at the end of this thing, we'll now use, we are actually trying to drop a standard operating procedure. What standard operating procedure means is that, what are the step-by-step -step things that, even if you are not here, you are sure that your people are doing? Because you know that these things are the things that are going to guarantee success in whatever you're doing. Are we following? So, the next thing is standardizing time. What you must realize is that the first key to driving success in any operation is that your time must be standardized. I know a, there's a, one of my, our, our clients that runs, they, they do a turnover of about a daily sales of between 300 to 500,000. Once it's 8 o'clock and you go there, the pharmacy is open. If it's 8.05, and the pharmacist on duty, or whoever is on duty, comes to work by 8.05, they deduct 1,000 from the person's salary. Now, to you, you might say, ah, this person can't, why that is wickedness. But assuming you are flying on, a, on an aeroplane, which pilot will you trust more? The pilot who walks into the aeroplane and checks everything step by step, or the one who enters at any particular point and starts to fly? Because this, this woman knows that Time is important. She has built it into the mind of her customers that if you come by 8 o'clock, any particular day, where our shop is open for business. What this means is that if you are running your business, the first standard you must set and insist on is timing. Because there's a way, if you remember when um, ABC started, one of the unique selling points of ABC Transport was that they have a fixed time when the bus moves out of the park. And whether the bus is filled or not, when that time gets to that, when it gets to that point, the bus moves. And what he meant was that people would now start to follow them because we are sure that by 7.30 your bus is going to move. The same thing is applies to your business. If they know that if I come to this hospital or this pharmacy by 7.30, I'll find somebody. By 7.30, they'll be walking to your business. Meaning that by exactly 7.30, you can start making your sales. But how will you expect your sales to grow when your customers are not sure when to find you? The first most important point that for all of us who own business, or for those of us who want to run business, or those of us who are working for people, and if we, because if a business is doing very well, what will happen to us, our salary and incentive? It will increase. But if a business is going down, sales is going down, what will happen to our salary? It starts to go down. So if we don't start to value time, and if we don't say specific time for opening and closing for our business, and we need to understand too that, especially in Nigeria, it has not come down to a good state. But in Abuja, they are actually started to run 24 hours pharmaceutical services. It means that, assuming you are run a proprietary medicine shop and you don't set specific time for your business, it will be extremely difficult because I know that those of us who are into proprietary medicine, most of us desire to move our business into a very big pharmacy shop. If we don't start to adjust what we are doing, it will be extremely difficult for us to grow our business. You know, I, I just um, finished a program at Lagos Business School. Now, I say in Surrey, and the, sh the, the school is located at Aja. And for those of you who have visited Lagos, you know the amount of whole traffic jam at CMS. You can spend like about one hour there. But the policy at the Lagos Business School is that lecture starts by eight by nine o'clock. Once it's nine o one, the door is shut. What that makes does to each and eight, all of the students and the staff is that wherever you are. You make adjustments and you make sure that you live on time. Because you are very sure that once it's 9.01, that the lecture has resumed. Meaning that you can actually plan your day based on what they are doing. The same thing applies because as at now, the most successful university in Nigeria is Pan-Atlantic University. They, they run the Lagos Business School. 
So if a successful organization is doing that, it means that we need to value our time. The next thing also about time that we need to set very clear, especially for those of us who are in management level, and for those of us who are in hospital settings, that we need to be very clear on the maximum number of minutes that a customer has to wait for us. Because if I come into your business and I want to buy something, and I have to wait for about 10 minutes, in my mind, I'll be thinking, where else can I go and be attended to faster? How many of us that have, has it happened to, you are driving a car and you want to buy fuel, and as you go to, want to drive into the, the filling station, you see three cars there. How many of us still driving? Most time we just continue driving, looking for the next filling station. The same thing applies to our business. If in our business people come and seek you there, nobody wants to line up to wait. So the next thing we need to be very clear, sure about is that we need to tell ourselves the maximum time that a patient will stay on queue before he gets attention will be two minutes, one minute, or five minutes. So that when you time it and you set it, and then for those who are responsible to execute, it, execute that, you tell yourself, see, Anytime anybody stays more than this minute, somebody will be sanctioned. That will automatically, our mindset starts to change. Because I'm saying this, um, I've seen there was somebody who was complaining to me about a pharmacy. He walked into the pharmacy to buy medicine. And the sales girl there were watching DSTV. I said, excuse me, people who have this, nobody turned. Excuse me, I want to buy this drug without even turning their eyes, you know they. And it was the drug that this guy was seeing on the shelf there. Nobody cared that this person... So you need to understand that because you know one of the things we say that we need to understand is whether we are in business or we are in business it helps differentiate that is why you are looking at your or the other pharmacy it seems they might be doing better than you because they are taking time to clearly state what are the things that are business and what are the things that are business because if you don't state this thing out clearly the same thing will apply to your business because most times you are not there in your business to say these are the things that will be applied. But if you have set clear standards, then you have things that you can measure and use to judge what is happening in your business. The next thing too you also need to be very clear about is the number of minutes or maybe hours that you assign for break to your people. Because if you don't do that, you find your people going for, okay, I want to go, to, go for break. And the guys might end up, maybe where they are eating, they are watching, um, they are playing Chelsea versus Man U. And they are on break for about two hours. And the girls, maybe when they, are, when they go out, there is something new on um, WhatsApp. And they are chatting there for about three hours. But if you have set clearly the number of minutes that is allocated for break, everybody knows that from so time to so time is allocated for break. So that when you leave, you know that you are expected back at this particular point. Now, if you are running a business and you are sure that, if my, that whether you are there or not, that my staff is always at her duty point, will you be bothered that nobody will be there to attend to your customers? But because you have not set out clear standard that this time to this time is a period for break, it means that anybody can walk out for break at any particular point. Now, for most of us in our line of business, our traffic peak are usually in the evening. What if your people decide to say, okay, man, by 7 is the time I want to go for break. That is when the, the customer is coming in and that is when your staff is walking out to go for break. And all this is happening because we are not set out, this is our time for break. If we don't set the time for break, it becomes very, very, very difficult. The next is the shift time. If you have about three staff, 
And you don't clearly state that each staff is going to work from so 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 time to so 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 time. It means that because you don't tell me the hours I'm supposed to work, I can come in at any particular point and leave at any particular point. But also because human beings are not machine. See, for after eight hours, the law of diminishing returns start to set in the brain of any human being. It means that if you've not designed the shift in your business in such a way that each of your staff works at most nine to ten hours at most, it becomes very difficult for you to get the maximum result because the person will be there and somebody comes to buy um, ampicillin. The person gives the person um, revampicin. So, it's for you to form a new habit. Now, because of it's the way you dress that you'll be addressed. And the way you dress, address is the way you'll be perceived. Now, when you want to move, let's say you've been perceived as somebody who looks well, who looks fine. Now, when you perceive as somebody who dress well, will somebody perceive you as a professional? Now, because they now pre perceive you as a professional, anytime you even decide to move from your, your current employer to another person, you'll see that this person coming to us is a, actually a professional. And the amount of salary you can ask for will actually be higher. Because it has been actually been shown that that is why whenever you are going for anybody is going for an interview, they actually dress very well. Because they know that whatever the company is going to decide on whether to employ them and what they are going to pay them is actually based on their, um, their appearance. If you know that the perception you create on the day of interview will determine the amount of money they will pay you, why don't you form it as a, as a habit so that when you want to move higher in life, you can actually command more income? So the next point too is standardizing your shelving. You know, one of the things that a lot of um, businesses does is when you are starting a new business, everywhere is very neat. All the shelves are very clean. But we fail to understand there's something called depreciation, which is actually affecting our shelf. It means that a shelf that is brand new today, left that way, by the next 12 months, would depreciate. Now, how many of us have, in our various businesses, a standard on how to maintain our shelf? One of the things you find in successful business is that each shelf has somebody who is responsible for maintaining it, cleaning it, and arranging the drugs there. Now, because you standardize it, if you come and any shelf is in disarray, you know who to hold responsible. But if you don't standardize the arrangement and the maintenance of a shelf, what happens? There's something called broken window principle. And what does it mean? It means that, let's say you want to turn this place into an area boy center. All he needs is for somebody to break one window here. Now, when somebody else is passing and sees a broken window, okay, this place, okay, no, let me use a very popular example. If you want to turn this front of this place into a refuse dump, all he needs is somebody to just drop a pack of um, fast food. And that person is passing, and see, because he saw that um, pack of fast food, drops pure water there. And that person, as they are driving, has a, a, a black nylon filled with waste. And they see this, this and there, and they throw it and it lands there. Because people see the three waste there, the one in their house, they carry it and put there. Maximum six months, you come there and you see a mountain of refuse dump. Simply because the first refuse that was dropped, nobody took any action. Your shelves start to depreciate because nobody is responsible for maintaining it. When the shelf starts to get dirty, nobody is responsible for cleaning that particular shelf. And one day you come into your shop and you're wondering, what happened? This shelf I paid so much money to set up. How come it's filled with dirty stickers? How come a white shelf are turned into a brown shelf? What happened? Is because you have not set clear standard for your shelves. And your floor. You walk into most pharmacies is and, and um, proprietary medicine place and it's littered with empty packets. Without understanding that your, your customer judge the value they will de derive from your business based on the appearance of the business. You know, I yesterday I was um, helping... Um, a Nigerian pharmacist who trained in UK to fill out some forms. 
And as she was explaining to me why she read pharmacy, she said that when she, she, she was in the UK for a very long time, when she came to Nigeria, she fell sick and went to a hospital. That just the appearance of the hospital in Nigeria made her feel that her case is, is a hopeless case. And she decided that when she graduated as a pharmacist in the UK, she would come back to Nigeria to practice. Now imagine the perception in people's mind. That hospital might have had the best doctor. But because she perceived based on the appearance that this place, because of the look, is a very low quality hospital, that my life might actually be in danger. The same thing might be happening to our customers. They walk into your place and they look at the arrangements, look at the shop floor, pure water packages everywhere, pieces of paper everywhere. They will ask you, do you have a chloroquadin? You say, what is chloroquadin? Well, that is what my doctor asked me. Without knowing that, he just want to give you an excuse to walk out. Most times, those funny names they give you are just a way of walking out. Because what they are seeing, they are feeling that this thing will make us, our case worse. The point is, who is responsible for the short floor? If you don't have people whose job is to maintain the standard of your short floor, then expect more cases of fluorocrupadine. Yes. And when they do that, they walk away. And we don't want that to happen. So I want us to be very clear about setting this clear standard. And one of the challenges I have with especially young pharmacists, you know, there was a part of the thing I also help um, people to do is to recruit pharmacists for them. So we got this young pharmacist just finished his um, youth service came to the, a shop to work and that day there were the shop owner the MD went to the market came back, MD followed in bringing out the drops the drugs, carton from the car So okay now, pharmacist come and help in shelving said it's not my job now when everybody in the business is saying this is not my job it means that one day you walk in and suddenly, because it's nobody's job to clean the shop floor, everything is turned into a refuse dump. One of the things that we need to be very clear about who are responsible for everything. And it also comes to appliances. The, the DSCV and the GoTV that we have in our place. Whose job is it to ensure that certain channels are not allowed to be watched in the shop floor? Because if we don't say clear, you, you are in charge of the television and it must be on CNN, it must be on health station. If you don't do that, anybody can pick up the, the remote and move it to Telemundo. And for the next three hours, anything, any customer asks for in your shop, you know they. So for you to be able to fight that, you know they syndrome. Somebody has to be responsible for the appliances including the radio because when he's playing you go chop my money and the girls there are bedouin you don't expect somebody who is they are looking for whose money to chop and somebody is coming to ask them do you have um quarter if you want to sell your quarters or you want to sell your other light you must be very sure that Somebody is responsible for the appliances. So that when somebody walks in and asks for Kamosunate, there's somebody who is attentive to make that sale. Or else, okay, or else they're asking for Kamosunate and what their people are saying. What they are hearing is what, um, maybe is it Diego or whatever name that is calling it this thing. And they are hearing, okay, Diego just left and they are saying Kamosunate is no day. Okay. Yeah. Dressing. You have addressed shelving. You have addressed floor. And now you have addressed appliances. Please, in all these things that you have addressed, are there supposed to be heads for all these appliances? Because the reason, the truth is that I have seen situations where somebody is giving responsibility for appliances. And because that person giving responsibility for appliances he is the smallest in that team. Maybe he's the youngest in the team. Every other person intimidates that person. 
Has it happened before? Does it happen? Okay. So please, eh, okay, when you advise us, eh, give us ideas on who and how to choose rightly the people that should take care of this. Okay, so let me share with you um, this example. Assuming, um, assuming a, a traffic man warden is standing on the street and you are and you are driving, just normal yellow, yellow police, and you are driving, he says, ask you to stop. Will you stop? The normal tra- traffic police now that's on the junction asks you to stop. Will you stop? Just normal you. Okay, so you stop because you respect him. Now, assuming a group of um, area boys that feel that they own the land, come and they are driving wow, wow, and he asks them to stop. You think they will stop? Now, assuming there is an armored car with um, 10 mobile police standing behind him and he asks them to stop, you think they will stop? They will stop because they respect the authority backing him. If you give somebody some responsibility and you don't give him the necessary power, so those times he, he switches it off and somebody says, put it on. And you don't sanction the person that puts it on. Automatically, there is no power backing the responsibility you've given him. So even if it's the smallest person you give that responsibility, make sure that your authority and power is behind that person. So that whenever anybody goes beyond, violate the rule that he says in that appliance, he switches it off, and one person goes and turns it on and reports to you, and you don't do anything to sanction him with your power, it means you've not given anybody any responsibility. Did I answer the question? Okay. So, what I want us to do now is the dressing code, shelving, flooring, and appliances. That has to do with standardizing the appearance of our shop, our hospital. So that when somebody comes in, the person doesn't feel, oh, I'm going to be more sick walking into your place. You know, there are, if you've gone into most children's hospitals now, you found out that the nurse is now, they no longer wear the whites. They actually wear um, dress with actually toys and all these um, fancy food things designed. It's done because the appearance of whites tend to scare children. And for you to make children in a children's hospital to be happy in your place to walk in, you need to show the appearance that, oh, this is a playful place. So that they can actually associate the hospital to the classroom 